I'm going to try to keep this kind of short. This is a review, but largely because my view on the game is obviously, like with most games, fairly uninformed, especially most games within the last uh, decade, two decades. Fairly uninformed because I, I've played this twice. Um, once opposed, where I totally screwed it up, and now Solitaire, where I screwed up a lot less. But I do think, uh, well, I know that there are people who are, for whatever reason, kind of interested in what I think of a game. I think they're more interested in, gee, how much did you like it and why, and stuff like that, rather than anything that they can really um, put necessarily to their own decision as to whether or not to buy it. But, I, whatever. Um, Alright, so, first of all, looking at components, um, this is, you know, your standard GMT deluxe treat. Now, this is the second edition, I think, of it. Um, nice, sturdy counters, wooden blocks, wooden dice. A little grump on the cards. These are your deluxe treatment GMT cards, and they're hard to shuffle. Same statement I'll make many other places. If you need to protect your cards, if you're the kind of person really worried about, you know, cards getting damaged, you're putting them in a sleeve. And it doesn't really matter how sturdy they are, nor does it terribly matter how easy they are to shuffle, because you're making them harder to shuffle, but sturdier with that protection. Great. Well, if you're not that kind of person, these suckers will chew up your hands. <laughs> and they're very hard to riff. You can, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what that that's called. Uh, anyway. Uh, that kind of shuffling works fine with them, but that tends to, in my view, damage cards more because it kind of uh, impacts the edges. So I don't like to do that too much but it's very painful to do any kind of ruffle on them, and that kind of sucks. Uh, otherwise, on the components, you have these really wonderful player aid charts. Now, I didn't play the Solitaire game. I never have. I probably... Mm, I can't say I probably never will, but it's unlikely that I'll be too interested in it, because it does play fairly well for a two-player CDG uh, without Solitaire rules, just playing one hand or the other. One problem with that, hey, things like the WMDs, you get to roll a die, try to figure out, eh, which way am I going on this? But I think it is nice for some people to have a solitaire rule set. Uh, I know Marco was talking about it and seemed to think that it works pretty well. Me, no opinion. Uh, these, uh, these are very good at uh, telling you what... Um, all the different actions you can take are, and hopefully I have two of them. Yeah, There's one for each player, and because each player has very different actions, these are very different. So sometimes you may need to look at your opponent's player aid card, or else page through the rules and try to figure it out there. The better presented here, um, reading the rules themselves, well... I'm not going to yell at these rules because I think they're actually pretty damn good for getting the information across that you absolutely need in the least amount of paperwork. The biggest thing that I would suggest, and I don't know if they really state this here, they do say the player aids summarize the rules. Um, I think it's really important if you're looking at this game. Get some pieces on the board, fiddle around a little bit, look at the player aid chart, maybe play it a little bit just to see how it all interacts because the rule book doesn't tell you. It doesn't really help anything like that. And I read the rules and kind of said, okay, I kind of understand these systems, but I've got no idea what it all means, which is very much the same feeling I had with Twilight Struggle. But it's elevated in this, and it's elevated even more because there's two different, completely different sets of operations each player can take. It's a completely asymmetrical game, fitting for an asymmetrical type of warfare. Uh, the rules themselves are actually quite short. I mean, you're talking uh, 14 pages, 
including the one player rules. Twelve pages, a little less, because we count that as two, yeah. So call it ten and a half pages of uh, actual rules for the game. But don't let that uh, get your hopes up too high. This is not Twilight Struggle. Uh, this is a game... So Twilight Struggle kind of slapped me across the head, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Well, after a few plays, I got a feel for kind of what I'm doing in Twilight Struggle. This game hit me across the head two or three times. And, and it really, uh, you know, there's a, not a lot of rules here, but a lot of how do I make these work for me? What am I trying to do? And it's not, you know, the victory conditions are printed right on your player aid chart. What you're aiming to do is right here. Everything's here that you need really to understand the game is sitting on one sheet of paper and then here's some charts to follow through with it that you kind of have to pay attention to. So this is almost the entire game on these couple of sheets in a very condensed, easy to handle blade that's wonderful when you're playing. But when you're trying to understand the game, the rule book's a little sparse on, on, on things. I'm not saying that there's stuff missing or anything like that. It's just you don't really have a great feel for that. And then the secret that I found. So like most GMT uh, treatments, it comes with a nice playbook. Great. The scenarios aren't on here. The scenarios are actually just sitting on the back page of the rule book. There's very little information needed for setup. There's not a lot of pieces to, to set up and play with, so it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't need, you know, two pages of setup for each scenario or anything like that. There's a, a list of all the cards. I'm a little saddened this is a numerical list, which isn't necessarily how you're going to be accessing it when you see, uh, gee, I'm interested in this particular event, that I know of from some other card, but I have no idea what number it is. So you kind of have to look through the entire list to find it. And that makes it a little more difficult. It would be nice if they were um, alphabetized. In fact, there's no reason that I see that the numbers don't match in alphabetical order anyhow. Uh, but they do not. There's I don't know, clumps and stuff that you can help find, but it's not as tremendously useful as it could be. Of course, if you have uh, a text version of this on the computer, you could just alphabetize it out and you'd get all these values. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, to the secret here, there's this whole... Most of the playbook is filled with an extended example of play, and some people love stuff like that. That doesn't get to the meat to me. Um, it might be fun to read. I haven't done it yet because it's just not the kind of way I learn uh, something. And it's useful for some, but here, bang. Here's what you need. It tells you, and this may have been added for the second edition or something, but it tells you what each person needs to do in order to affect certain things. And then there's uh, nice designer's notes, which is always important to me, trying to explain the why of the game. Okay, and well, and then there's the board, which I found largely useful, but sometimes, and I don't think it's the board itself, sometimes there were things that were hard to see. I think it's more the all, all the counters and, and where everything is kind of, but overall I think it per, provided, you know, with so few pieces on the board, it provides a very good overview, and it's very pretty and very sturdy. And nice. uh, the one gripe that I had, and I mentioned this a number of times in the playthrough, uh, some of the event counters, these little guys, don't provide the information you need on the cards. In some cases, most cases, that's fine. Uh, a lot of the cards that put a counter in play, you could keep the card out for further reference. The playbook does not give a reference of what the cards do. At least not that I noticed. It gives historical information. That's good, but it doesn't fully give the information that's on the cards. While that may seem like a, a repeat for some, 
that, that's not necessary. Sometimes it's useful to be able to page through and study something like that for some people. For me, that's not too important. But it is important when I have a card out, uh, a chit out there that I don't know what it did because the card's gone back into the deck. And that's just a, a, you know, in an otherwise a game that really bends over backwards to try to give you all the information you need available in a very easy way. I feel like you have to kind of take notes on a couple of cards just to make sure that you remember what all the effects are because the card goes back in the deck and it's gone. Um, it's only a couple of cards that happens to, but it can be a serious problem where you're looking and saying, I don't know how that works. Some of the cards also feel like they need a little further explanation than even the card provides, and there's nowhere to look except maybe online where somebody has a question. I'd rather just blow my way through it and try to fake it, and, well, I got into a little trouble with that, with, certainly with one card. And if I had had the card in my hand, I would have understood it, but without the card in my hand after the event had taken place, it wasn't clear to me how it worked exactly. How about the play? So, you have three options for decks, and I, I went over this in my rap, actually, but I, I, I do think it's an important aspect of the game. The smallest game, and I, I don't know how long it takes to play uh, a game because I throw so many breaks in when I'm playing, but the smallest game is a single deck, and I definitely got the feel that the game is completely different between one and two decks because in one deck, there's this progression in the game where this point of balance gets reached, and in my game it certainly happened fairly early into the second deck, if not at the end of the first deck, uh, where either player has a chance to win off the automatic victories without things getting kind of out of hand, which is to say, the way the game progresses, you're going to be put in a situation where you're worried about blocking the other guy from winning immediately, and you've got your own opportunity to win immediately. In fact, on the last couple of turns, it was obvious both players had a chance to win immediately. And there's sort of this, okay, who goes for what? Well, the guy who's got the advantage in the long-term game, the guy who's going to win uh, if all the decks runs out, kind of can play a defensive game. He just wants to hold things as they are while looking for opportunities. But the other guy has to worry about ending it quicker or turning uh, the entire dynamic of the game more in his favor. So he's got to take more risks or whatever. Now, in the, uh, in the one deck game, I don't think you get to that. I think that it will be very unlikely for an auto win in the one deck game. Unless somebody does something really foolish and probably there's a bit of luck on the other guy's hand in terms of he got a hand that's really useful and the other guy kind of misplayed it. So, uh, for example, allowing a weapon of mass destruction in that first deck in the, in the U.S. That's going to take a lot of luck to get it into the player's hand, in the jihadist player's hand. And then the U.S. player more or less has to let him do that. There's very easy ways you can just hold a card as the U.S. player. So you've got a lot of assurance, not absolute, but a lot of assurance that you can probably stymie uh, any sort of surge on a turn. And likewise, the U.S. players' automatic victories are probably really tough to reach without, uh, without basically the, the jihadist kind of rolling over and playing dead. I, I played against my wife, and she totally did not get the game, and I was close to wiping out all her cells, but, and I think I was cheating to do that, by the way, and uh, I, I can't be certain, because I don't really remember the entire circumstances, but I think I was doing some things that I wasn't allowed to. And even then, I just couldn't do it. It's just too easy to react and keep putting more out there. So you've almost got to have two threats of ways to win the game 
in order to push one in one direction and one in the other. Now as you get into that second or third deck though, it changes. Because there, you might be taking a risk to go for your own auto win and exposing something that maybe you could be playing a little more carefully. That's what we saw in my game. The jihadist player kind of had to take those risks because they either had to go for an auto win or an equally difficult trying to turn the dynamics of the game. And in either case, they were going to be risking things that would make it possible for the U.S. player to win because the U.S. was in the lead at that point. It's a game where definitely the balance kind of shifts throughout, uh, but it can kind of start weighing on one side or the other. And it becomes kind of obvious, but that doesn't mean you're out of the game, especially in that two-deck or more deck game. Uh, I assume the three-deck is the same way. Uh, it's just you're going further and further along. Once most of the countries have been aligned, rolled for, tested, uh, you've got more options because some of the victory conditions, the resources, having resources aligned to your side or having a certain number of countries aligned to your side, come out the more you play. So both players get closer to victory on the, that uh, line the more you play. And then from the other side, you have also this more chances of getting, say, the weapons of mass destruction into play, or more chances of, let's see what else we have here. Well, the others are tougher, more long-term for the, the jihadists, more like the U.S. objectives, where you really kind of have to be doing well to be in a position to win. The weapons of mass destruction is really sort of your trump card that you can win with without doing terrible. Uh, I think what else? So, one person brought up the, what they did not like about Twilight Struggle, and I haven't played it enough to get to this point, was that there's certain set strategies. And that makes sense in Twilight Struggle, not that there always are, but from a design point of view, you can see where that happens because the deck is scripted in the sense that you've got your early war, your middle war, your late war, you've got certain events coming into play. In this you don't. Now I think there's a scripted, I think there's a pattern to the game that it will naturally follow with decent players. But I don't think that means particular countries or particular regions are necessarily more important. And in fact with the multiple different scenarios, you have different starting points, or you have the Al Gore option, which just sets the U.S. to soft, but that's a huge, huge effect on how the play is. The um, posture that the U.S. has dictates whether or not, you know, you can deal with these Islamist regimes by going for a regime change, or if you have to kind of play towards different levels. And there's real disadvantages to having an Afghanistan as an Islamist regime, which it starts the game as. Uh, so, by being soft, you have to play a very different kind of game, I think. And I actually think that's harder on the U.S., uh, even though the world opinion may is very likely to shift towards soft, you can always reposition or use an election or something like that to get yourself into a different position. Um, so I don't think that's going to be an issue with this game. Although I certainly haven't played this one enough to say if I haven't seen it in Twilight Struggle, which I've played significantly more, like, you know, maybe six times or so. Uh, balance? Eh. It's hard to tell. Uh, there's no way I can tell from this position as to how balanced the game is, or how balanced specific scenarios are, obviously, since I've only played one scenario a couple of times. But, what I can say is if there is a balance issue, you can certainly bid in this game. There's no rules for it assigned, but there are a few things that immediately jump to mind as biddable options. One is 
allow the U.S. to bid their initial prestige. And the person who takes the lower gets the U.S. Uh, another might be bidding to be able to change a couple of country statuses. That would be a more complex type of setup. I think the prestige is probably the best and easiest and is probably able to handle just about any problem that there would be. Uh, that would, of course, twist the realism slightly in the sense that your starting position wouldn't be at least what the designer thinks is the appropriate starting position at a given time. But if you're looking for a, a, a better balance to a game, I think letting the players have that kind of ability is always a good, a good idea. And it's a very, very simple mechanism in this case to put in play. There's nothing tricky if, if you just do it with the prestige. Uh, so one of the points that I came up with, though, based on Twilight Struggle, it's not, and it's obvious from the ratings, as popular as Twilight Struggle. Even though I think this may actually have some significant advantages over it, it also has some disadvantages. It's not as simple. It's not as simple to learn. It's not as simple to grok. And the asymmetrical warfare means you can't necessarily just play in the same way as your opponent challenging them somewhere. However, you do find that you've got that same kind of play response, play response. Uh, so it's got that same hook and feel to the game as a Twilight Struggle does, but with a level that makes it perhaps less interesting uh, to somebody just kind of new to the CDG and new to this kind of power politics type uh, game. But if you like Twilight Struggle and you feel like you've kind of played it out and want to explore more, want something more uh, intriguing, this is definitely a great move for that. If you like Twilight Struggle and just want something similar to it, you may or may not want this. I think after a few plays, anybody who can kind of feel comfortable with Twilight Struggle can probably feel pretty comfortable with this. But I think that the level of first look at the game and, oh my god, what do I do? Which is there for Twilight Struggle for me, it certainly was. I, I felt like I was just kind of blundering along. I felt the same with this. It, take, it took me uh, about a half a deck to feel like, oh, I kind of know what I'm trying to do now in this game. I was wrong, but mainly because I think I was misapplying some of the roles. Playing this against Solitaire, I had some feeling for that, but again, had to start playing with that kind of, I'm just battered around reacting. I love the mechanism of, I've got this operations card, that if I play for operations points and it has an event that's bad for me, it triggers. That's the coolest thing in, in the Twilight Struggle series, and I think 1960 has it as well. Uh, it really leaves you with this feeling of, okay, I want to do something, but I know bad things are going to happen if I do it. How realistic is it? Well, I don't know. Because in a sense, you're dealt your hand, and you have to play the whole damn thing out in this. Uh, the Jihadist player has a little bit of ability to kind of slough off a card in that first plot space. Just like in Twilight Struggle, you have a little bit of ability to get rid of a card by blasting it into space. The U.S. player has the ability to hold a card and not play it if he really doesn't like it. And sometimes events shift so a card's no longer bad for you. Sometimes uh, maybe a card will get pulled from your hand and you lose something that you didn't really want to play anyway. A lot of the worst events that you have are the cards you most want to play, though. The big three ops cards are going to hurt you when you play them. 
and that's pretty standard uh, in Twilight Struggle as well. So you've got this, if I do something big, something bad's going to happen. I don't know how realistic that is. I don't know how well I can tie all that together. Uh, but the causality doesn't have to be direct on there. Sometimes big bad things developing would spur on, say, a U.S. action, or a big U.S. action coming, or, uh, you know, like seizing funds or something like that, would spur a quick flurry of attacks, so it almost feels right, even though maybe the I'm holding a card and making the decision between these two things isn't really uh, fitting to the person who's actually making the decision. But, again, maybe in some ways it is. Overall, I, I, I definitely enjoyed it. I gave this a tentative 6 when I played it with my wife, knowing that it's probably going to go up. I think I'm going to shift that to a 7. Uh, even, even just playing it one player, sol uh, playing the two player rules solitaire worked pretty well for a CDG, I mentioned this before, because there are no interruption events. And the fact that the players get to do two things in a row, I like that. I really do. Uh, the usual alternating play doesn't let you build a combination together in the same way. In this, it allows you to think with the same hat, figure out, okay, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and then you just do it, right? <laughs> um, I, I feel a little more comfortable. That's a little bit more space between switching hats, and that, that helps in the solo game, but I think it also helps me playing opposed, being able to see and make a plan. I do A, I do B, now it's your turn to do A and B. Uh, just a little bit better, so it, it felt uh, good for that for me. This may, upon more plays, get an even higher rating, but it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because uh, I didn't get as much of sort of a link to what's going on in the play uh, that I like. I Maybe that's still the fast play, pace of the CDGs, but it's also somewhat the, the very feel of the game. And Twilight Struggle kind of suffers from this as well, but I think a little less, which is I just don't get this image of what's going on in the world. It's this covert actions and everything, and 